Cool. So, um, yeah, my name's Rowan Depelia, and uh, I lead the analytics platform team at Atlassian. So I've been at Atlassian for about seven years now, and I've been fortunate enough to witness quite a large part of our data journey over this time. Um, but before I get started, I'll talk a little bit about Atlassian. Hopefully, many people already know what Atlassian is, but I'll give you a little bit of a, a clue as to who we are. So we've been, we were founded here in Australia about 20 years ago, and, or just over 20 years ago now. And uh, we have offices globally employing around 9,800 people. And uh, we're serious about creating products and practices that encourage uh, open work and collaboration for all teams. And we do this with tools such as Confluence, which is a system that helps teams create and share content, uh, Bitbucket, a tool for helping teams plan projects, collaborate on code, and test and deploy, and uh, Jira, one of our flagship products used for bug tracking, issue tracking, and project management. A little bit about our data landscape as well. So we have managed to consolidate everything now onto, or all of our internal use cases, onto one single lakehouse architecture. And we operate at, now at a petabyte scale, growing at a crazy rate, uh, at terabytes a day. Um, uh, most of Atlassians, to some extent, use our platform. So, you know, we're a large company, but I feel like basically every single organization, to some extent, uses the platform. And finally, we are AWS backed. So we use things like Kinesis for data ingestion, we use S3 for storing all of our data, and we use uh, EC2 for our compute. So the Lakehouse, like I mentioned, is used by all parts of the car company. It's basically powering the business. And like, I'll give you some examples. In one extreme, we have uh, data analysts and our support team using the Lakehouse to uh, measure our product health through the number of incidents and support contacts that we get, and then using that to drive priority as to what kind of things we focus on in uh, product development. And then on the other extreme, we have, a, like, say, for example, a data scientist in our product teams using the Lakehouse to uh, exp run experiments on our products and facilitate better product decisions. Both of these use cases are ultimately using the same data catalog, the same data store, the same Lakehouse, basically. So let's go back to the beginning of the journey. And I like to imagine that there is like this sliding scale between a data warehouse style architecture and a data lake style architecture with the warehouse, I mean the lake house being that sweet spot in the middle where you get the best of both worlds. And in the beginning at Atlassian, we're very much at the data warehouse end of the spectrum. In fact, we had two data warehouses. We had a Postgres data warehouse that was used as an enterprise data warehouse uh, and it was here that we did all of our business intelligence and dashboarding and uh, like a lot of our internal enterprise teams, like our sales, our marketing, our, uh, I don't know, support, we're using this platform to, uh, to drive the business ultimately. On the other end, we had a Redshift data warehouse and that was used for research and development. And um, it was here that we shipped all of our clickstream analytics, our behavioral logs. And uh, we use things like notebooks and SQL analytics to better understand the user journey and our user patterns through our products. Unfortunately, this architecture came with challenges for us. For one thing, we noticed that a lot of our users were copying data from one, lake, from one data warehouse to another, and these copies were very brittle and added uh, delays to downstream pipelines and analysis. We also faced several other problems. Uh, for example, we had differing syntaxes between the two. So if an analyst was working on one and they wanted to try and do something similar on the other, they would have a lot of trouble trying to convert queries between those two things. Secondly, there was concurrency issues. And Atlassian at this period of time was in a period of hyper growth. Um, and so our volume of queries was growing tremendously. And I remember back then, I think we just migrated to AWS, and we were upgrading the RDS instances on our Postgres database every, I think, like month, basically. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and lastly, uh, uh, we, th there was like this significant cost to pulling data between the two data, data warehouses. There was a lot of use cases where people were trying to pull data from one thing to another. And if they couldn't do it, 
uh, because the engineering tax was just really high. And so a lot of analysis just never really actually happened. So it was just too high to do that, that work. So it was at this point back in, twin, uh, back in 2018, that we, or 2016, that we decided to reevaluate our architecture and what we were really trying to achieve out, uh, for, for Atlassian for, from a data perspective. We knew that data volumes were going to grow exponentially, and we wanted to uh, build something that was going to last for a long time with Atlassian. So it was also at this point in time, back in 2016, that we saw plenty of uh, um, blogged about, discussed about um, uh, uh, topics around uh, building out S3 da data lakes. I think uh, Netflix uh, came up with a really good example of this back then as well. Um, and so following these examples, we decided to take the leap and combine both of our data warehouses into one data lake style architecture. So uh, what we essentially built was an S3 based data lake. Uh, we used Hive and Presto on EC2 and DMR, and we tried to, and to serve up the various use cases across the company. Uh, the beauty of this is now that we had all of our data in one place, that meant that there was a lot less engineering tax uh, and copying data from one place to another to do analysis. So that was a great win for us. Secondly, there was infinite scalability. We now could just keep on throwing data at S3, or we could keep on ex extending the size of our clusters, and we didn't have to really re-architect anything. Unfortunately, this came with some other challenges for us. Uh, performance was not on par with what we had in the data warehouse architecture. Uh, so we could get good concurrency when we're using Presto, but we're struggling a little bit with like smaller queries that you would typically run in a data warehouse, um, not returning really as fast as what we had in the data warehouse architecture. Uh, secondly, uh, modeling was a challenge for us, and um, for, for any sort of dimensional modeling we're doing, if we had to do constant updates, that was really challenging to, to do on like a Parquet-based S3 data lake. And lastly, there was a high, higher barrier to entry for our, our analysts and our data scientists using the products, using the platform. Um, they were often, like basically my team, the analytics platform team, was considered basically a bottleneck for the organization trying to do anything. Every time a table needed to be created or a library needed to be used in, a pro, in, in the, the platform, they had to come to us and ask us for help ultimately. So it was at this point back in 2018 that we discovered Databricks. And um, even though the lake house paradigm wasn't really a thing back in 2018, uh, we felt that moving, adding Databricks to our stack helped us move a little bit closer towards that Nirvana state. And in the grand scheme of things, not really much changed initially uh, when we added Databricks. So uh, we still were able to use our own S3 buckets, and we're still able to use things like the AWS Glue data catalog uh, to store our table definitions. However, what did change for Databricks, or what did change when we added Databricks was the experience that uh, Databricks added on top of the S3 data lake. So we are now started to get a lot more benefits from that that, that like, ultimately moved us closer to that lake house architecture. Uh, what things we could start to see were, for example, we could start to see a higher performance for, for a lot of our queries. And this is thanks in part due to like, Databricks' optimized runtimes but also as a result of some of the, the benefits that came from converting a lot of our Parquet-based tables to Delta, Delta Lake. Um, and so this ultimately meant uh, an improvement in the experience for business intelligence style use cases. And in recent months, we've also been trialing out uh, Databricks SQL um, uh, to see if we can further improve that slice and dice experience for our users. Um, the Data Lake also allowed us to bring back data, database style uh, statements, so we could finally start doing updates again and merge statements and things like that um, that we couldn't do before in the data lake architecture, but we could do like you know well back when we had a data warehouse. So this is again like bringing those two worlds together. Um, most unexpectedly for us was that we were no longer seen as a bottleneck for innovation in the company. Uh, less and less teams were approaching us to do anything that uh, they normally would have. They can create their own tables now. They could, we could give them a cluster and they could have complete autonomy over that cluster. And lastly, with Databricks, we are on an open source platform. And the benefit for, that, for us for that is that we don't feel this level of lock-in. We can spin up other compute if we need to. Uh, we could use Flink tomorrow and still use our same Delta 
Delta Lake files on Flink. Uh, we also get to take advantage of quite a lot of, a lot of the, um, the benefits that come from the open source community around Spark and um, Delta Lake and um, MLflow. There's so much innovation happening even outside of the Data, Databricks team. Now, that's all really exciting. Uh, but what also is exciting is the impact that the lake house has had on Atlassian from a business perspective. For one thing, we've seen a really good cost reduction when compared with the data warehouse architecture and the data lake architecture. Um, so, for example, we're no longer paying to keep disks warm like we were on a data warehouse style architecture when uh, things were not being queried as often as they would. Uh, but also, like thanks to uh, Databricks' optimized Spark runtimes, our CPU time on EC2 was way shorter, which meant that we were ultimately paying less time to paying for less time to keep our uh, instances running. Uh, the other benefit for us was that our data engineering teams could remain more focused. And what I mean by this is that, like, if you had a data warehouse and a data lake, there was a lot of context, context switching between the two, but we have all of our data engineers working on one platform. This also kind of makes it a little bit easier when we're going out to market and we're trying to hire new data, data engineers. We can just go and look for one skill or a shorter, shorter level skill. Uh, we feel that there is also easier governance. Um, one of the things I, I like to think about this is that there's only one, one place that you have to now secure and um, govern as, a, as compared to like if you had a data warehouse or multiple data warehouses in a lake. This is just one thing that we have to look at and focus on. And lastly, we feel that there is greater autonomy for a lot of our teams. And this is, to me, one of the greatest accelerants to innovation in Atlassian at the moment. So now we believe that we are getting super close to hitting that Nirvana lakehouse architecture state. And we feel that Databricks is going to help us get there. Some of the things we're really excited about uh, trying in the few next coming months, uh, we want to try and move a lot more of our BI-style workloads to these Databricks SQL endpoints in Databricks. Uh, being a relatively new feature, this is not something we have really completely adopted yet. We also want to keep on converting a lot more of our parquet tables and things like that across to, um, uh, to, to the Delta Lake format to further improve performance and further improve some of those difficult dimensional modeling use cases. And lastly, we want to start looking at how we can use Databricks for more sensitive data use cases. And the launch of the unique catalog is something that really excites me because then we can start to do things like better policy management, auditing, lineage, and all of those exciting things. So my takeaways from all of this, well, I hope your takeaways from all of this are, uh, one is there is no longer really a need for two separate data things. I think that we're at this point where technology is advanced far enough that you can start to consider a single lakehouse architecture. Secondly, I believe that the Databricks platform is, is the best place to, take, uh, uh, to, to go on this journey with because you have, they're already one step ahead and the convergence of data, data, data warehouse and lake is really con uh, possible with them right now. And lastly, I'm a strong believer in having your foundations in open source and non-proprietary formats. Uh, I think this gives us the ability to not feel so locked in with Databricks if we do decide to change in the future, but also to take advantage of things like, you know, uh, the open source community that's happening out there, things like uh, uh, the changes that are happening in the Rapid Spark community, as an example. Uh, some final words before I finish up. Uh, we're always hiring, so you can check out uh, for jobs that are... Um, uh, we're hiring, and <laughs> I had to make a pitch, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, we have a few other talks happening today. You can check out Lily Lee uh, from Atlassian, as, as well as uh, Zek and Rivati, uh, I think at 11.30 today on Destination Lake House. Thank you. Uh, I'm passing over to Frank from Databricks. Cheers. Thanks.